Hi, this is Ike Ellis, and this is Survey of the Azure Data Landscape. In this session, we're going to talk about all the different data technologies that exist in Azure, and we're going to answer the question, when should you use them, and what do they do? I remember when I was young, I traveled to London for the first time, and being raised in San Diego, I wasn't familiar with mass transit. I'd never really been on a train or the tube or a subway or anything like that. So I remember being in Paddington Station, and the it was just overwhelming to me. I just saw people coming and going, and I saw the train board with destinations everywhere and platforms and trains coming in and out, and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know whether I should use the tube or the train or a bus. I didn't know. I just knew I needed to be someplace, and I just stood there overwhelmed with what to do. Well, it took about two days, and two days later, I just felt like I was the master of London. Once I understood how to read a train schedule in the tube system, I could get anywhere I wanted for relatively affordably without ever having a car. And for somebody in San Diego who is in kind of a freeway concrete jungle, that was it just gave me a great feeling of confidence and of capability. So I, I get the feeling of being overwhelmed, I can see how that would happen if you were looking at Azure and all your different data options because there are a lot of options here and you need to know when to use it and what to do with it. Um, hopefully what we're going to do today is calm those selections down so that you know when to use which offering. So the very first offering we're going to talk about is blob storage. And as we talk about each one of these offerings, we're going to say what it is, how it's used, and what the competitors are, and then we'll run a quick demo. So Azure Blob Storage is a place for files. That's what we store, and any, any kind of file, JPEGs, AVIs, PDFs, uh, anything that you'd like. Log files, SQL backup files can all be stored there. In Azure Blob Storage, what we do first is we create an account, and in this case, I created a Sally account. And then underneath that a Blob Storage account, you create containers. And though you can have as many containers as you want. You can have a ton of containers. But it's very flat. Unlike a file system where we would have folders and subfolders, in Azure Blob Storage, we would just have a very flat list of containers, and then we would put the blobs inside each container, like we'd put files in the folder system. So, like I said, we could store PDFs or docs. What, what distinguishes Azure Blob Storage from like your SAN is that Azure Blob Storage is massively scalable and highly durable, which means your, your data automatically gets duplicated. So if a server goes down or a rack goes down, your data is always going to be available to you. And you even have other durability options that we can talk about in just a second. It's also massively scalable. Uh, last time I checked, we had 40 trillion objects stored in Azure Blob Storage, and I think it's doubled since then. It, it is just a phenomenally popular product, and there are a ton of objects there. Uh, so it can handle all of the files that you can throw at it without ever running out of space. Um, that's a bit different than the SAN, right? If you have an on-premise SAN and you run out of space, you're, sometimes you go to your SAN vendor and you say, hey, I need, you know, 10 more terabytes, that could be like a $40,000 option, right? It could be pretty expensive. Where Azure Blob Storage, you only pay for what you use, and there's always free space available to you. Also, you get a millisecond SLA. So it usually it's less than 100 milliseconds. I think the SLA is 150 millisecond. So your blobs always come back to you in a predictable amount of time, um, and they do a really good job of that. In addition, Azure Blob Storage has something called a CDN service that you can place over Azure Blob Storage that will put your files in cache and serve your files locally to the user. So like Florida users can get Florida files out of cache, uh, you know, Europe users can get European files out of cache and avoid the network latency. Azure Blob Storage has something else that allows for that, but it isn't quite as fast and it's quite a bit cheaper. The way you use Azure Blob Storage is through the Azure Storage Client. It is an SDK that you can download and start immediately using. Uh, we have them in .NET, C++, Java, JavaScript, and Node.js, and Android. At, but at its core, Azure Blob Storage is just a REST API, at just a typical URI that you would interact with like you would any other URI. So we talked about Blob Storage fault tolerance. By default, 
your data is duplicated and put and spread across so that if one rack goes down your data is always available now if the whole data center goes down you might consider making your blobs geo redundant so if you do that that means that all of your data gets stored in a full other data center and used in a full other data center now you pay for that it's double the price and if you want that data in a different data center or you know three geo distributed replicas if you want to read access then you pay even more you pay triple the price almost so that is your fault tolerance and, and kind of data center failure options we already talked about kind of bobs you have but one thing on this slide I really like using Azure Blob Storage to back up SQL servers. Uh, it's possible to back up a SQL database that's on-premise and use Azure Blob Storage as the destination for those files. And so you can easily, easily do that. You can also use Azure Blob Storage to share files with clients. You can use it if, you if you're doing an uploader, like you let people submit a resume through a website, you can store the resume immediately into Azure Blob Storage. Azure Websites is a platform as a service offering, which doesn't really give you direct access to the web server, it, and it doesn't make any guarantee of persistence. So what you would do if you had any files that you wanted to persist in between you know, deployment is you would use Azure Blob Storage as the file storage area for it. And then in Azure Virtual Machines, when you create a new drive, it actually creates that drive in Azure Blob Storage as the it's the back-end engine running an awful lot of Azure's products. The main competitor to Azure Blob Storage is Amazon S3. S3 is the oldest service that Amazon's been using, and it's very popular. I don't know if you remember, but two months ago, S3 went down, and it took like 10% of the internet with it, and they did a whole retrospective to determine what happened. It ended up being a database update with a lack of aware clause, I think. If you read that document, it's, it's pretty interesting. And then, of course, you compete with your on-premise SANs and arrays, but those are expensive and they require management and um, you usually have to pay for all the data you're gonna use in the next three years up front, regardless of whether you're using it or not, where Azure Blob Storage, you only pay for the gigs you're using. So let's demo that. So I'm gonna go back into my, my little uh, app here and I've got some demo code and it's all available to you on GitHub. This one's called Blob Storage. So I'm gonna set that as my startup project and just to, oh, I need to stop my project, hang on a second, then I'll set this as my startup project. And I'm gonna use the Azure portal. So first off, let me show you how to create a storage account. You just create new, and then you search your marketplace, and you say storage, and you should see, like the first option is usually a storage account for blobs, files, tables, and queues. We're doing blobs right now. Now I have already created a storage account called Data Ike one and I thought I put it up here on my dashboard. I guess I didn't. Let me show you how to put something on your dashboard. If you go to all resources, this Data Ike 1 blob storage, if I click the little ellipsis button, I can say pin to my dashboard. Now when I go to my dashboard, I can see Data Ike, oh, that's the Data Ike 1 right here. Um, the other thing I can do is I can organize my dashboard by just dragging and dropping it someplace that I'm likely to see it. So done customizing and it's good. Okay, so now that I have Data Ike 1, if I click on it, you can see that I have blobs. And if I click on blobs, I have a container. That container is that folder structure I told you about earlier. My container is called Demo Container Block Blob. And if I click on that, I already ran this update earlier. So what I'm going to do real quick is I'm just going to delete this blob so that right here it says no blobs found. That's exactly what we want is no blobs. Good, okay, so let's do it in code. So you'll see I've got this PNG here called hello world.png, that's my blob. So as we step through code, just keep that in mind, that's what I'm actually uploading. So I'm gonna go ahead and start my app and step through it. So I step through, there's that, it's just a constant um, hello world.png. Now, when I wanna gain access to my storage account, I need an endpoint, I need an account name, and I need an account key. And that's my way of telling Azure that I am who I say I am. So when I come back here, if you click here on my original screen where you saw Azure storage account here, and I click access keys, you can see I've got a store, an account name and a key, and I just 
put those right here in my code, and that creates my storage connection string. And what that does is it lets me create a storage account client. So I go ahead and step through this. I create that storage account client. Then, now that I have it, I'm going to go get a container reference, and the container I want is demo container block blob. If it doesn't exist, go ahead and create it. But it, it exists already. And now that I've got it, now I'm going to grab a reference to image to upload, and I'm going to get a block blob reference to it. And then I'm just going to call upload from file async and off of the storage client that's, that's specified on the container, and I'm just going to say take that image and upload it. So I step that, one line of code, I come back here, and then if I go back to my, to my little blob storage list, you can see that if I refresh, hello world.png got uploaded at 1.59 p.m., 2 p.m., which is you know right now. Now, there's another tool here that Microsoft makes for free available to you called Azure Storage Explorer. And if you want to add an account, you just specify what? You specify your name and your key, and now all of a sudden you have access to your new storage account. And once you have that, if you click on your blob container, you can see all the blobs in that container. Now, this tool is a useful tool because it allows you to interact with blob storage in a graphical way and not in a... Um, not in a programmatic way, not using the URI, but so if you want to upload files or download files or do whatever you want, you can use this tool. Redgate also has a tool that can help you interact with blob storage, um, which is very, very helpful. Okay, that's blob storage, and you can look at my sample code if you'd like, and there's examples for deleting blobs and, and things like that, you can see in the sample code. Okay, that's blob storage. Now, let's move on to the next topic. Table storage. So table storage is very similar to blob storage. It's got the same scalability and redundancy patterns. It's very affordable, and it's very, very fast. So you might be thinking, well, I already create tables in SQL Server. Why would I create a table in Azure Table Storage? Well, there are a lot of things that Azure Table Storage has in common with SQL Server. You, it has columns. Columns have data types. Um, you, if you have the primary key, which we call the row key, you can go collect that data. That's all very common, right? But Azure Table Storage doesn't have store procedures, doesn't have referential integrity, doesn't have indexing, doesn't have any of the other things that you're used to in SQL Server. In fact, it's really just a no SQL key value pair solution, which means that you have to have the partition key and the row key in order to retrieve a record. So if you need to join between two tables, you're doing all of that in code. You're not doing that with a command. And if you need to you know, enforce referential integrity, you're doing that in code. And if you need an index, you're creating that index somewhere in Aratus Cache or in um, another Azure Table Storage solution. But you're, you're, there's really nothing there to kind of help you recreate a relational database, right? It's just straight, very fast table structures. And it is very fast. We once, five years ago when Azure SQL Database was all brand new. We did a solution in that, and um, it was folding on us. And there was no performance SLA at that time, so I couldn't like scale it up. So Azure SQL Database just kept throttling us over and over again, and we, we had to rip it all out and replace it with Azure Table Storage. And it was brilliant. Like it was very very quick. We we could never overload it. Another big advantage of Azure Table Storage is it doesn't really charge you for compute. It charges you just for the storage that you should have. So you can shard it. You can do whatever you want. We'll talk about sharding in just a second. But you can you know, store it in multiple tables, do whatever you'd like, and only get charged for the amount of data you're actually using in Table Storage. Um, so when you use uh, Table Storage, you have the same storage account used with Blob Storage, right, Sally, here. Instead of having containers, we have tables. So we have the customers table and the wine photos table. And then inside those tables, we store our entities. And those are like, they're going to show up kind of column structured. But really, they're the properties of our POCOs that will appear in the entity. And you'll see that in code in just a second. So we can shard this. And what that means is I can store all of my action movies in one place. And I can store all my comedy movies in another and drama in another. And they will, in effect, be being responded to by different compute. So that means that the comedy I.O. 
contention won't interfere with the performance of the action movies, right? They'll be separated. So, and it means that if I need to get like some type of aggregate, I can fan out across all the partitions and get my data and come back, get, keep them all busy. So you can decide how you're going to partition your data in table storage. The main competitor to table storage is DynamoDB table storage on the Amazon side, on the Amazon Web Services side, AWS. Now, it, Dynamo is an umbrella term that's used for a lot of different products. It just happens to be table storage is one of them. Dynamo will come back as we talk about our next thing. Um, but before that, let's demo table storage. So, so we stop this project and we right click on table storage and we set a startup project. Okay. And now, um, what I want to show you real quick is that I created this POCO. And this POCO has a last name and a first name. The last name is the partition key. The first name is the row key. And it just has some properties, email and phone number. It's a pretty simple POCO. And now that you've seen that, let's go ahead and run through the demo. So the first thing I'm going to do is create that storage account off of a connection string. And guess what? It needs an account name and a key, just like the blob storage demo. And now I'm going to get a table reference, and the table reference is to the customer table. And if it doesn't exist, create it, and then return the customer table. Now that I have the customer table, I'm going to pass the table into some code I wrote. I'm going to create my POCO, so I can step over this. It's just a bunch of properties, no big deal. Then I'm going to call an insert or merge entity async by handing in the table that I want to add and the POCO customer. So as I do that, this is code that I wrote. This, I create an insert or merge operation saying, hey, please do that for this entity. This entity is that Sterling Archer, that POCO that you saw earlier. And then on the table, execute that insert or merge operation. And then take the results, which is just the object coming back, and return it as inserted customer. Now, what did that do? Well, if I come back to my... Azure Storage Explorer, and I go to Tables, and I go to Customer, you can see this is how it stored that data in Azure Table Storage. Um, and I could have had 15 columns, or 20 columns, or 30 columns. Why is it called the key value pair if I could have 30 columns? Because it's referencing how we retrieve it. We retrieve it knowing the partition key and the row key, and that will give us access to all the other properties that are related to, the, to that table in Azure Table Storage. All right, that's Azure Table Storage. So the next topic is something that's brand new. So DocumentDB was released about three years ago, and it's a JSON document store. And it's an Azure Platform as a Service offering. So DocumentDB was renamed yesterday at the Build Conference to Cosmos DB. And the reason why it was renamed is because DocumentDB started doing more than just storing JSON documents. It's, it now also has key val no SQL key value storage, and it has uh, graph databases. So let's talk about the JSON document store aspect of it, because we've already talked about the key value no SQL store part. Um, so a JSON document is just that. It's just a bunch of JSON. JSON is hierarchical. It is very simple. It tells me the field name and the field value. It has a data type, so I could store string or booleans or ints or date times. Um, it also allows me to store arrays. So this John Smith object has an array of phone numbers, and those, each one of those phone numbers is an object in and of itself, and it has a type and a number. And this children array is empty. He doesn't have a spouse or kids. So JSON looks like data the way in C sharp we would think about data. So C sharp we would have an object hierarchy and that object hierarchy would say like we're creating a conference for people to come to sessions. So a conference would contain sessions and each session could have a presenter and it would have attendees. So we would create a speaker and attendees and that would be contained in the session object which is contained in the conference object. So the data is naturally hierarchical. Um, and it's really easy to take data from the, the C-sharp object hierarchy and just serialize it out to JSON. Well, we can use that same mechanism to just save the JSON document using Cosmos DB, formerly called DocumentDB, 
as a document store. Now, why would we store these documents in Cosmos DB as opposed to just storing these documents just to a file system? Well, every single column, every single property in the JSON is indexed by default. So that means that if I wanted to find out how many people in my database were 25 years old, I could easily query that and get every document where age was 25. So there's a lot of power there. In addition, it will automatically um, partition and distribute the data across multiple replicas. So we can store DocumentDB databases across multiple geographic locations, different data centers. We pay for that when we do that. But then we can keep those replicas con somewhat consistent with each other so that if I'm on my little mobile application, I'm hitting a uh, data center that's on the west coast, and if somebody in Boston were hitting a mobile application, they'd hit the data center on the east coast, and then there's replication between the two nodes to keep them consistent with each other. And so DocumentDB brings a lot of features for JSON document storage that you just couldn't get if you just like stored this out in blob storage or something like that. So when we model things in Cosmos DB, we really want to focus on reading and writing being a single operation so that we avoid the round trip. So that's quite a bit different than like modeling something in a SQL database where we are going to shred uh, our object hierarchy into five or ten different tables and then have to maintain the consistency between those tables and then know what order we'd have to interact in those tables so that we hit the parent table first and then all the child tables. That's an awful lot of code that we either have to write or we have to offload to an ORM like Entity Framework or Dapper or in Hibernate. Um, we don't have to do that using um, Cosmos DB. We could just save the entire document without shredding it into different tables using one command and you'll see that in the demo in just one second. You can also interact with Cosmos DB using a SQL-like language. It's a little bit different because JSON is a hierarchy, so we have to use the, C the language to like dive into the hierarchy a little bit. But once you figure out how to do that, you can go get the JSON documents you care about by just writing straight SQL. There's a query playground on this URL. My slides will be available to you. And this query playground you can play with and learn all about DocumentDB SQL. The competitors to, excuse me, I said DocumentDB and I meant Cosmos DB. The competitors to this are MongoDB, which is a very popular document store that's been around for a long time and uh, has the vast majority of the market, and Amazon DynamoDB on the AWS side. So with that, let's take a look at the demo. Okay, so I'm going to go create DocumentDB. Uh, this is co my Cosmos DB demo. I'm just going to set that as a startup project. Now, remember that earlier example I told you about conferences having sessions and having attendees and speakers? That's this POCO that I created. This create conference method creates a conference object, and it creates all the people and all the sessions, and then it ties them all up to each other. Just straight hierarchical POCO object model. That's really easy to, to look at, right? So I want you to remember kind of this data organization because you're going to see it as we run through the code. So let's come back up here and the first thing I'm going to do is just create a bunch of documents. So we'll start this app. Got my breakpoint. Okay. Before I can interact with DocumentDB, I need to instantiate the DocumentDB client. The way I do that is by getting the key excuse me, the endpoint and the key for DocumentDB, just like I got it for blob storage and table storage. So once I have the client, I need to gain access to a database. So a database is just my main unit of collecting all of my JSON documents. And in this case, I'm creating a database called Conferences. I actually already have it, but if I didn't have it, I would just use the create database async method to create that conferences database. Now that I have it, inside the database, I can have multiple collections. Let me show you what that looks like in the portal. So if I go back to my dashboard, here's my conferences Cosmos DB account. Inside here, you'll see that I have a collection. So, so the database is called conferences. The collection is like a table where you would store 
documents that are similar to each other in function or in schema in the same collection. Collections are also your scale unit. That's how you determine how much money you're going to pay for DocumentDB. So you can either scale it up or scale it down by collection. So if we click on the collection and then open up collections, uh, open up the database, pardon me, open up conferences database, then open up the collection, then open up documents. Okay, so it looks like I actually have some documents in here already. What I'm going to do real quick is just delete these documents so that it's empty and I'll put new documents in there. Okay, so now we've got an empty documents collection in the conferences database. Let's go ahead and create some. So this is me creating the collection. It's go get the fall conferences collection. That's that table that we're using to organize documents. If it doesn't exist, call create document collection async to create it, then return it. Now let's go create a big conference. And that's the POCO that you saw me do earlier. So I create that conference. And now that I've got the POCO, what I can do, it's just one line of code just right here. Create document async. I hand in a link to the collection and I hand in the, uh, in this case, this is the conference, right? You can, we can explore this. We can see things like show me, hang on. We can say, show me the sessions, show me who's speaking, show me who their employer is, right? Okay. And I just call create document async to save that document. Now, if I go back to the portal, I can, let's click off here real quick, click back into Data Explorer. And then here, under Documents, this is the document you just saw me create. And that's the JSON serialized out from that object hierarchy. So now what I can do is step out. Well, I'm just going to step out of this and do this two more times. So now that I've done it two more times, I go back into Data Explorer. I open up conferences, I open up fall conferences and documents, and now you can see three conference three conferences have been created. And for this one, like this is conference two, I can actually edit it in line. I can say, hi, Wintelect viewers. And now if I just update it, that is now saved. Awesome. And and I'll watch, I'll show you querying it. So you saw me call that one method to serialize the object hierarchy out to JSON and save it in DocumentDB, how would I go get it? So let's query it. So what I would do is go get the DocumentDB client, just like last time, go get the, the database, go get the collection, and now let's query it. So this, what is this? This is just straight link. So I'm saying, hey, go into the client and go into the conferences database go into the fall conferences collection and just give me everything. And now that I've got everything, it will just iterate over it. So one at a time, by the way, if we want to like hover over this, you could see that it collected it and then it created my object exactly the way it was before. And I didn't have to write any like assembly code or anything like that. It just wired it all up for me. So do that again. And now let's go ahead and take a look at our command prompt. And you could see, hi, Winolik viewers, that was my edit from before, but I just retrieved it in link so you could see that it was happening in real time. Cool. Okay, and I could show you like updating and deleting and, oh, you know what though? Let me just show you um, one more way of, of getting data. Look at this, this is inline link. I'll show you both ways of getting data. This is inline link, um, so that will work too. Give me everything with a specific name, and it gives it to me. And then, in addition, I can also use that SQL language where I say, hey, use my client, create a document query for the conference database for the fall collections collection, and just write the SQL out where the start date is greater than a specific start date. In my case, the start date is 11-1-2014. So now that I have that, it's going to find three that are greater than that. And those are the three. Oh, there's that high Winolik viewers again. Okay. Now I can delete data. It's just one line. I can update data. It's just replacing it. You basically replace the whole document. Um, but I want to show you one other thing you can do, and that is you can create JavaScript stored procedures. 
You can also create JavaScript triggers and user-defined functions. Um, this is really good because if you are a web developer and you really know JavaScript really well, you can create JavaScript in HTML to create beautiful front ends. You can use JavaScript in Node.js to create a, a function mill tier. And now you can use JavaScript as a sort of procedure language so you can really create JavaScript end to end here. Okay, and that's Cosmos DB. So let, now that we've talked about those three, let's talk about two of the different ways we can create transactional SQL Server databases in Azure. So there are two different offerings. There is creating SQL Server in an Azure, Azure virtual machine. That's called an infrastructure as a service offering. And what that means is that you're creating a virtual machine just like you'd create a virtual machine on premise where you install the operating system, you install SQL Server, you back it up, you virus protect it. But what you're not doing, like you would have to do on premise, is you don't worry about if a hard drive fails, you don't worry about networking infrastructure, you don't worry about power, you don't worry about fire retardant. Like all of that is done for you but you still have an image that you're managing. If you don't want to manage the image, if you don't want to manage that version of SQL Server, then you can move to a platform as a service offering. And that platform as a service offering is called Azure SQL Database. And it's been around for a long time, since like 2011, 2010. And that is, you just create a database, and I'll show you how to do that right now. I'm just gonna do it right now. So if I go to my portal, and I create new, and I can say, I want an Azure SQL database. Uh, actually, I'll just do SQL database here. It says, okay, what do you want? Yeah, this is fine, just a straight, this is a platform as a service offering. So I'm not installing the operating system. I don't even know really what version of SQL Server I'm using. I just say, my database name is gonna be Wintelect Demo V2. Okay, and put it on a subscription and put it on the Western United States and we'll go ahead and create a sample database like AdventureWorks LT. Put it on this SQL Server I've already created, although you could create one in two seconds, it doesn't take much. And then here's the pricing tier. This is where I'm specifying how much bandwidth, how much CPU I think I'll be using. So in the standard tier, I'll, it'll cost me $75 a month. If I want even better, like the premium RS tier, this, th these DTUs are controlling the compute. So all the way at the top, I can say, please give me this for $930 a month. That seems pretty cheap. Uh, why is that? Because it's only 1,000 DTUs. If I do premium and go all the way to the top, it's uh, $16,000, but it allows me to have roughly 4,000 DTUs, which translates to an enormous amount of transactions per second. I think it's something like 3,000 transactions per second, but I, don't quote me on that. I just think that's like a rough equivalent. Um, and then my storage can go all the way up to like four terabytes if I'd like, or I can just pick a basic offering. And my basic offering, I can say, yeah, I'm fine with the 100 meg database and it's five bucks a month. But in this case, if I go to the lowest one, it's free. So 100 megs to start, fine. And I apply, and now it begins creating that SQL database for me, which is very nice. Um, so before I show you how I can actually use that, I did wanna get uh, a data warehouse going for, a, for my next demo. So sometimes the data warehouse takes a long time to load. So now that you've seen me create an Azure SQL database, creating an Azure SQL data warehouse is actually the same thing. So I could say, name it, choose my subscription, put a sample database on it, choose my server, create a server login. In my case, I'll do Ike and I'll create a login. And then for performance, it's $6 an hour. So Azure SQL Database, Azure SQL Data Warehouse is very expensive. So usually I start at the 151 an hour and I'll go from there. And I'll pin that to my dashboard, just to remember it's called Azure SQL DW Wintelect V2. And I'll click Create and we'll let that go. That'll be for a later demo. So 
now that you've seen me create an Azure SQL database, um, let's go ahead and connect to it. And the way we connect is right now, you can see this is Azure SQL Ike, and I just connect it using, um, using a connection string. Let me see if I can find the connection string by looking at the actual database. So let's find, where is that database? It should be here now. Um, let's see. There's Wintelec Demo is the data warehouse. Oh, Wintelec DB. Yeah, that's the one I want. So if I click that, and it says the server name for that is Azure SQL Ike.database.windows.net. So I take that and I go into SSMS and I just make that my connection string. And now I'm connected. And if you see here, Wintelec DB, this, these, are, these tables are available to me in SSMS. So if I say something like select star from sales lt dot address and execute. Oh, is that right? Oh, let me pick the right database, pardon me. There, I'm interacting. How quick was that? So you watched me create an Azure SQL database as a platform as a service offering and immediately use it in under five minutes. So the reason why I'm mentioning that is, let's take a look at what happened in the background on, your, on the slides. Okay, so in Azure SQL Database, all the data is backed up for you. Did you see me create a backup policy? I didn't, it's automatically backed up. And most of the offerings have point in time restore. So I, it's backed up and the log and SQL Server is getting backed up and I can restore it like at any time. I can say, please restore the 10 a.m. log or the 12 a.m. log or right up into the time I just had a failure. It can be geo redundant. You pay for that, but you can distribute um, the secondaries across multiple sites. So when I say distribute the secondaries, this is what I mean by that. When you create any Azure SQL database, you immediately get three different copies of that database, a primary and two secondaries. You, if you geolocate those secondaries, you can put them in another data center, and that way if the data center goes offline, another data center is capable of coming up and maintaining transactional consistency and you know, servicing your clients. It's a very powerful tool. It comes with Azure SQL database for no extra money and no configuration. So th these are the kinds of things that a powerful platform as a service offering can do for you that would be very, very hard to do like in a VM. There are some unsupported features though, like uh, SQL Server agents not supported, the CLR as of right now is not supported. Um, so it's not feature complete. You can check this URL to find out the latest information on what features are not supported. Uh, and you can scale up like you just saw me scale up when I created it. The main competitor to Azure SQL Database is Amazon RDS, but Amazon RDS uses Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres, and MySQL as an engine, and you can just choose which one you want. Azure SQL Database is only SQL Server, but there's a big but, and that is yesterday, Microsoft announced a new offering called Azure Database, which will support the MySQL engine and the Postgres engine. Now you saw when I created an Azure SQL database that I was using SSMS to interact with it. If you use Azure database for Postgres or MySQL, you get to use like MySQL, you can use MySQL Workbench. For Postgres, you use PG Admin or whatever command line tools you're used to using. But everything works. So you could use the, the tooling environment that you're used to configuring for yourself, you can do in Azure. Okay, and you already saw me interact with Azure SQL Database. Now, we also have SQL Server in a VM. This is the most feature complete version of SQL Server. It's very, it's on par with SQL Server on-premise. If you have an on-premise SQL Server and you wanna move to Azure, this is the easiest path to getting something in Azure. Now, like I said earlier, you manage the backups, you create fault tolerant options, you manage disk space, you manage patching. You just don't manage all the hardware and the networking and power and stuff. So here's some performance considerations. I don't want to go over all of this, but basically 
pay attention to your disks. If you use premium storage, SQL Server will go faster in a VM. Also make sure you use a VM size DS3 or higher and that you turn off geo-redundant storage on your storage account so that um, we don't have that overhead because it's not necessary in the VM. Um, now, for backups, like I said, you configure it, but you can configure to backup to Azure Blob Storage. You can also create an always-on availability group, so you would create multiple VMs and then create the cluster and then create the always-on availability group inside the cluster, and that would all work for you. You can also use mirroring and log shipping. One of my favorite features, though, is you can have an Azure VM act as a secondary to an on-premise always-on cluster. So you could have you know, a primary and a secondary in, in your personal data center and then use Azure as the off-site replica so that if your data center goes offline, someone else can go take it over for you. The main competitor to SQL Server in a VM is putting SQL Server in an Amazon EC2 instance. Okay, so that is all of our options up into Azure, uh, uh, up for transactional SQL servers. Now let's talk about analytics in the cloud. And we'll start by doing Azure SQL Data Warehouse. Azure SQL Data Warehouse is a massively parallel processing system, which means that we could have multiple machines uh, can be responsible for one database. So we'll have four or five or ten nodes handle one database. And we would create tables on that database, and those tables would be divided up across multiple nodes, like sharding, like we talked about earlier. So we could say all of the data for May 2017 is on this node, and all the data for April 2017 is on this node, and all the data for February is on this node, and so forth, right? We're divided up. We could do that by date, or we could do it by customer key, or we could, however we want, we can shard it across. Now, what Azure SQL Data Warehouse will do is it allows you to write jobs using T-SQL, the same T-SQL you're used to writing with SQL Server. And it will take that T-SQL and it will execute it across all the nodes of um, Azure SQL Data Warehouse. And it will let the response come back and it will collect the response and compile it and hand it back to you. So Azure SQL Data Warehouse allows us to have up to a petabyte of data. It is kind of expensive. Let me show you that. I'm going to show it to you in the portal. So here's my portal. And if I want to create a new Azure SQL Data Warehouse, I just click New. And I say Azure SQL Data Warehouse. Oh, I don't see it. Let me look under data and analytics. It's usually the first one. Let's see. There it is. SQL Data Warehouse. Um, where are you? There it is. Okay. So I click on it, and I just go ahead and create. This is a very similar thing that we would do if we were just going to create a regular uh, Azure SQL database. So I'll just call this a uh, Wintelec demo, and I'll put it on my subscription, and I specify what resource group I want it on, and then what database do I want? I'm going to use the sample database, and it's called AdventureWorks DW, and I'm going to put it on my Azure SQL Ike server, and then the server login, I'm just going to specify a username and a password, and pin it to my dashboard, and now it says, how big do you want it? Well, it's $6 an hour for 400 uh, data warehouse units. This is me choosing the degree of parallelism that I'll be using for the compute in Azure data, SQL Data Warehouse. So if I slide all the way to the bottom, I'll, I'll use it at $1.50 an hour. If I slide all the way to the top, it'll be $90 an hour. So that's pretty expensive. So be very, very careful. I would start at 100 which is a dollar an hour, assuming um, a 720 hour month, you know, we're, we're paying a lot of money for that. So if I go ahead and create that, it validates my choices.
and now it begins deploying that Azure SQL Data Warehouse. Uh, and I'll be able to use it in just one second. So here you can watch it kind of deploy. If you come back here to my dashboard, you can just watch my dashboard update right here. Um, while this is going on, I'm going to show you creating a new Azure SQL database too. It's very similar. So if I click new and I say I want a SQL database, there's SQL database, and I click create, and it's, like I said, very similar. We'll just call this Wintelect DB. Choose my subscription. Choose my data source. I'm going to go ahead and do the sample database here too, AdventureWorks LT. And then it's Azure SQL Ike um, will be the SQL server that I've already created. And here's the pricing tier for that that I was showing you earlier in slides. So you choose your DTU. And the DTU, very similar to Azure SQL Data Warehouse, where it was a data warehouse unit, DTU is choosing your scale unit. So in this case, if I say I want 50 DTUs, I'm going to pay $75 a month. If I say I want more than that, I'll pay $150, and I can specify my database size. That's me on the standard edition. If I choose premium edition, now I can scale up my DTUs all the way to, it looks like now they've got P15, which is $16,000 a month. And I can go all the way to four terabytes now. So I pay, that's, that's a lot, so I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to go to the basic tier, and I'm going to pay $5 a month for two gigs of data, and go ahead and click Apply, and now Create, and that gets created. And I can see it on my dashboard here. This is deploying my data warehouse. Oh, I didn't put the new database on my dashboard. Um, if I go to All Resources and go down to the Wintelect demo, Where are you? Um, let's see. I'm going to refresh because I don't see it. Mm, it's not appearing in the list yet. I think this is the d data warehouse. Well, all right. Well, anyway. OK. I'll show it to you in just a second. So now that Wintelect demo data warehouse is all created for me. And if I want to specify, if I want to see my connection string to it, I can look in ADO.net and I can see the connection string. And now I can create an app against it. Or if I just want to know what the server name is, I just grab this. Uh-oh. And it's this, it's Azure SQL Ike, and the storage URI is this URI. But I'm going to go back, actually, to that last screen and just copy this out of here. Azure SQL Ike, I click Copy. And now I'm going to just open up SSMS. And in SSMS, I'm going to drop that URI there, and I'm going to put in my password. Uh-oh. Hang on one second. Wasn't that the right one? Hang on. Yeah, that's the right URI. And that's the password that I just put in. Hang on one second. Hmm. I don't know why that password that I just put in isn't working. Um, let me see if I can change the password real quick. Um, hmm. Well, I'm going to use the query editor here to kind of show you interacting with it. I wanted to show you interacting with it with um, – with, uh, with SSMS, but I don't know why it's not letting me connect. But I'll just use this query editor really quick. So here, 
I know my schema already, so I can just say select star from, and I think I've got a product called um, fact account. Let's see. Uh-oh. Did it let me connect yet? Um, I really kind of want to show you this. And I'm not sure why that password hasn't replicated yet. Oh, there it is. Great. Okay. Here I am connected. And if I open up my databases, you can see that um, Wintelect Demo Database has multiple databases in the icon. That tells me that that is an MPP solution. That's the data warehouse. And if I open up my tables, you can see all the tables uh, in that. Um, oh, I don't see. I thought that I chose the sample database, didn't I? I don't see the sample yet, so it might still be building it. Um, let's just see if it's there yet. Nope, no, no tables yet. I think it's probably still creating it from um, the sample database that I chose before. So anyway, what I wanted to show you was that in Azure SQL Data Warehouse, you can use the tooling and the language that you're already familiar with using, and it will automatically spread those requests all the way through um, in, a, in an MPP environment across every node in Azure SQL Data Warehouse. So there's a lot, an awful lot of power there. Um, and it's still coming up. Hopefully, we'll see if it comes up at, towards the end. All right. Um, one more thing about Azure SQL Data Warehouse is that you can scale the compute separately from the data. You saw how expensive that was when you saw me create it. And to just kind of show you that, there's a pause button. So if I go back to my portal and I go back to Azure SQL Data Warehouse right here, you'll see right here a pause button. If I click that pause button, I stop getting charged for the compute. So that dollar fifty a minute or that you saw or whatever it was, um, that is now not charging me now that it's been paused. So if you're not using Azure SQL Data Warehouse, it's a really good idea to either programmatically pause it or to manually come here and, and pause it and stop getting billed. As far as a use case for Azure SQL Data Warehouse, it's only for analytics. It only supports 32 concurrent queries. So we're really only using it to do reporting or ETL or data cleaning. We're not using it for an OLTP solution. It is not intended for that. It is intended to replace your on-prem data warehouse that's growing and growing and giving you bad performance because it, it now is like a terabyte or five terabytes or 20 terabytes and you can't back it up, you can't um, maintain it very easily. So we're only talking about analytic workloads. We're only talking about data processing workloads. We're not talking about actually putting a front-end app in front of it. Uh, a DTU, like you saw in the portal, is usually done in 100 increments. Um, I would start small and monitor it, and then if you need it, just increase it slowly because it gets pretty expensive pretty quickly. You can partition data two ways. You can do a hash value where you choose the column that you're going to be partitioning. And if you have that column existing in all your tables, then all the tables will be partitioned the exact same way. Or you can do a, dis a distribute data evenly using a round robin method, which is an easy method to implement, but not that great when doing fan out queries because you'll more likely involve all the nodes all the time when getting ranges of data. So this Example is the create table statement. That create table statement looks just like it does in SQL Server, but it has a distribution of round robin. Or if you want a specific column, um, you could just you know create the cluster column store index by hand, and and uh, specify how you'll distribute distribute data. Here are some non-supported data types. Basically, we don't have access to the CLR and we don't have access to blobs. So no varchar max, no invarchar max, no hierarchy IDs, no geometry. Those are not supported in Azure SQL Data Warehouse. We also, no primary keys, no foreign keys, no check constraints, uh, no index views. So those are all, and no identity. That's kind of a big one. 
Now you might look at that and say, oh my gosh, that's a lot of features that I don't have access to, but most of those features were constraining us from using multiple nodes. And some of those features, particularly unique indexes and identities, the team is aware that it's really, really hurting people who are implementing the product, and they have prioritized fixing that. So I don't know when it's gonna happen, but I would pay attention to their announcements and see it, what changes in the future. The main competitor to Azure SQL Data Warehouse is Redshift. The main difference between Redshift and Azure SQL Data Warehouse is Redshift is built on Postgres SQL, and it uses the Postgres tools in the Postgres SQL language. And Amazon SQL Data Warehouse is built off of SQL Server, then it uses T-SQL. So if you're familiar with SQL Server, and you've got a lot of knowledge about it, then you're gonna feel more comfortable in Azure SQL Data Warehouse. And if you're familiar with Postgres, you're gonna feel more comfortable in Redshift. Um, another key difference is Azure SQL Data Warehouse will let you pause the compute and leave your data distributed. Redshift doesn't allow you to do that. So once your data is in, you're paying for Redshift all the time and the, the bills can be kind of expensive. So um, that's kind of Microsoft's competitive advantage is in pausing the compute and still having your data stay in place. Okay, the next topic and our last topic is Azure Data Lake. Um, Data Lake is Microsoft's newest Azure analytic product in the cloud. It was released about a year ago, maybe 18 months ago. And it is another MPP project. It is for distributing data across multiple nodes, um, for expressly for analytics, not for transactional systems. Um, Azure Data Lake is actually two different products. It's Azure Data Lake Store, which is how we store files in the data lake, and it's Azure Data Lake Analytics, which is the job engine where we actually execute the jobs. So Azure Data Lake Store is uh, uh, very similar to Azure Blob Storage, where we get a URI and we can store data up into the cloud and use it you know, as we see fit. We can also store very, very large files there. We can store like petabyte size files in um, Azure Data Lake Store, ADLS. Azure Data Lake Store gives us a web HDFS API over it. And why that's important is it allows us to use any of the Hadoop ecosystem tools over it. So HDFS stands for Hadoop Distributed File System. And it's basically Azure's HDFS implementation uh, in the cloud, although it doesn't use HDFS as its engine in the background, it just exposes the API so that you can swap um, Data Lake Store out instead of using HDFS. And, and like I said, the reason why that's important is we can use Pig or Hive or Spark or Storm or Scoop or Kafka over Azure Data Lake Store. So you don't have to use Azure Data Lake Analytics that second tool over Azure Data Lake Store if you don't want to. You can use Hadoop tools if you'd like. So Azure Data Lake Store um, is relatively cheap. It's more expensive than blob storage, but it's relatively affordable. Uh, Azure Data Lake Analytics is the job engine, and that is Azure's implementation of YARN, which is a Hadoop MapReduce replacement um, that stands for yet another resource app negotiator. The language that we use to submit jobs in Azure Data Lake Analytics is USQL, which is very similar to Transact SQL, but it has some differences which we'll talk about in just one second. Let's, let's talk first about the design motif of a data lake. So in a data warehouse, like Azure SQL Data Warehouse, there would be uh, the kind of the design principle that the data in there would be cleaned already. So in, in any data warehouse or in your data marts that you guys are using on premise, you would have this idea, this notion that any data that sat there would be cleaned automatically. And that if you went to report on that data, it would be really good data. Now, how does that data get cleaned? It gets cleaned during the ETL during the extract, transform, and load step. So we would use a product like SSIS to grab data from the data sources. We would clean 
the CSVs or the OLTP data or whatever it is. We would clean it in route and then we would put it into the data mart and then we would do our reporting off of this perfect, supposedly perfect data. A data lake is a generic data architecture term. All by itself, it's just a generic term that we use when we talk about Hadoop or Amazon S3 or any of the data lake products. Um, the data lake says that, look, the data has gotten so large that we can't move it around very easily. And so rather than moving it to a clean location, we're just going to collect all the data into one massive location and we're going to clean it in place and keep it without moving it. That's the whole idea behind a data lake. So when we interact with the data lake, we don't have the overhead of thinking that that data is clean. We might have to prepare it and clean it before we can analyze it. And then once we clean it, we're going to store the clean data in the exact same data lake because we don't want to take the overhead of moving it around or we're going to clean it in place and then once it's clean we're going to use that clean data to load a data mart or a data warehouse in a different product someplace else. So the, what I want you to get out of this is in Azure Data Lake we're really focusing on the data staying in place so that we can clean it or analyze it in place and then once we've cleaned it then to move it to a different location. Um, so Azure Data Lake Analytics, I told you we were going to talk about this again, uses uSQL to interact with um, the product. And just to kind of show you what that looks like, if I go back to my portal and I go to my dashboard, you'll see that I created an Azure Data Lake Analytics account. And I've also created an Azure Data Lake Store account. So this Azure Data Lake Analytic account I've been submitting jobs to it, and I can view all of those jobs. And these are jobs that I've ran in the past. I can just pick one of these jobs, like this one, and I can see how that job executed when it ran. But instead of seeing it, I actually want to show you the job, so I'm going to duplicate that script. What you're seeing here is uSQL. This is how I can type uSQL into my window here, into my command window here, and I can just execute it. Now. In Azure Data Lake Analytics, I choose my degree of parallelism when I execute the job. That's a lot different than Azure SQL Data Warehouse. Azure SQL Data Warehouse, you choose the parallelism for all the jobs, and you typically scale it when you create it, or it's a very deliberate action on your part. You say, hey, I want 100 DT, uh, DWs, or I want 400 or 800 or whatever I want, right? In Azure Data Lake Analytics, you're scaling based on the job, which means that this particular job can scale separately from a different job. And it's three cents per minute per AU. AU is my scale node. And if I, as I move this up, I just get like now I'm using 32 AUs and it's a dollar a minute. So quite a bit more expensive, but maybe it's quite a bit faster. So it might even out on me. So what does this uSQL script do? It goes into Azure Data Lake Store and it finds a log file in a folder I've created called IIS Logs. And then what it does is it creates a schema over that log file. This is what's called schema on read. This schema says, hey, that log file actually has a bunch of columns and those columns have names and they have data types. Once I've created that schema over that log, I save that in the at log variable. Now, I run a select statement over that at log variable saying, go by date and find how many hits by date I've ran in that log for January 2008. Once you have the number of hits by day, output it to dailysummary.csv and store it in Azure Data Lake Store as a CSV. So now I can go ahead and submit that job and it prepares it and then it executes it and it shows me how that job is running. I can manually refresh rather than wait for the refresh. And it just takes a few seconds. This job takes like 30 seconds total. So, um, so it's going collecting data. It's going to show me the job graph here in a second and the job graph is pretty interesting. 
Okay, here's the job graph and it will show me what phase it's on right now. Right now it's probably on extracting. Let's see if we can catch it in mid-phase. Just refresh a couple times. Okay, there's extracting and then an output. And then if I click on output, it says, here's the CSV that I outputted. This is a link to my Azure Data Lake store file. And if I click on that, you'll see that it tabularized that CSV for me so that I can look at it, or I could go directly to Azure Data Lake store and download it if I want. These are the results of that one query. That's one way of interacting with Azure Data Lake Analytics. Another way of doing it is through code, and I'm just gonna show you this real quick. Um, here is a USQL script where I can submit it if I click on advanced. Um, I can choose my scale, my degree of parallelism here. But one thing that I can do with my USQL script is I can gain access to a code behind file. This is C Sharp. So in ADLA, USQL combines the SQL language with C Sharp. And there is a lot of power to that. I can create C Sharp uh, methods in the background here that I can gain access to in the USQL script and use it, uh, you know, in place. Now, why is that awesome? Because USQL is doing my parallelism for me. So in C Sharp, I can write the functions that I care about and not worry about parallelism because the uh, ADLA is going to do that for me automatically and parallelize it for me automatically. H how does how do I know it's parallelizing? Well, if I go back to my job monitor here, do you see on this ex extract step, it said it used one vertex? That tells me that in this job, it didn't see a need to parallelize it. But if I saw three or five or 10 vertexes, that tells me that this is right for parallelization, and I might consider increasing the number of OUs the next time I execute the script to see if I get better performance. And that is Azure Data Lake. Again, another um, analytic offering used primarily with the Hadoop ecosystem and used if you want to scale based on the job and not based uh, individual job and not based on all of the jobs. Uh, there's a lot of Hadoop implementations, but really Azure Data Lake is kind of unique in its implementation and there's not really a direct competitor. You can use a lot of different data sources in Azure too. You can use MongoDB, Postgres, Redis Cache, MySQL, Oracle. They are all supported in Azure um, Postgres and MySQL are a pass offering now, but you can also install them in a virtual machine. If you call Microsoft for support on these products, they will support, they will um, answer your questions and they will not pass you off to anybody else. And that's it, you guys. I'm sorry I ran a little bit late. Thank you for sticking around. I hope you uh, learned something and I apologize for the slide problem at the beginning. Uh, thanks for coming, guys. If you need, to get a hold of me, here's my email address, my Twitter. Um, feel free to, I'm, I'm at Ike underscore Ellis is my Twitter, by the way. Um, or you can go to my website and see all my contact information and stay tuned because the slides will be available to you and so will the code. Thanks.